These days, business and entrepreneurship get a bad rap. Politicians accuse them of driving inequality while not paying their fair share. Corporate media portrays them as evil monopoly men, gouging consumers with higher prices, while academics and activists rail against them as climate destroyers only interested in one thing, profit. Our kids want to get out there and make the world a better place. But in today's culture, going into business is portrayed as just the opposite. A 2017 poll by Just Capital showed that nearly two thirds of Americans distrust the Fortune 500. And a 2022 Gallup poll showed a sharp decline in Americans' positive views of big business. In contrast to this narrative, today's guest Evan Baer believes that companies are the most powerful tool we have for solving many of the problems we face today. Evan sees starting a business as a heroic journey into the arena. He's a venture capitalist, serial entrepreneur, and the author of Get Backed, which has helped millions of founders craft their stories for investors. If you need a killer pitch deck, this book is a must read. Like too many do-gooding postgraduates, he headed for Capitol Hill, but then a chance encounter with famed investor Peter Thiel changed his entire perspective. And so it was really meeting Peter Thiel that reframed how I thought about business. I learned the founding story of Palantir, these three nerds sitting around and they watched the attack on the Twin Towers. And many people had this moment of, what do I do? And they just started thinking like, their unique contribution was they could build a company that would make the US intelligence services dramatically more effective, stopping terrorism. And so it's such a cool, like, I see a problem, and then I start a company to fix the problem, which is on the one hand, very obvious, but is totally radical thought today. Evan's mindset of overcoming challenges with a relentless focus on human flourishing is an inspiration for anyone looking to improve their own life and the lives of others around them. All right, Evan Baer, welcome to Dad Saves America. It's an honor to be here. Thanks for having me. So. When we first met, it was 10 years ago, uh, I just moved to Austin and somehow you found out about that <laughs> and invited me to an event, an event at this organization called Taneo, which you founded. So why don't we start there? What is Taneo? Taneo is a national leadership organization that recruits, trains, and accelerates uh, the next generation of leaders in America. And so some people are interested in politics, but what really got me excited to start it was this view that culture is created by what sociologists would call overlapping networks of elites. Now that sounds like fancy people <laughs> that go to boarding schools, that's not what we mean by that. It really just means people that have a disproportionate access to influence or capital. And so of course we have people that are interested in politics, but the idea is that culture is really created when you know NFL celebrities and filmmakers and investment bankers who share values work together to launch projects and initiatives. And so that's some of the, the theory behind it. On a practical basis, it's a little over a thousand people that are now good friends of mine that are working really hard to do things that we think make this country really strong and keep it that way. I wanna hear more about this theory of, of culture because you, know, you talked about it as being the intersection of, of, of elites interacting in different ways. That's interesting coming from you given your, your pedigree and your um, educational background. Mm. Because your education, we at Dad Saves America, I'm a big, I'm, I'm really into trying to like rethink education. Mm. Uh, so, and a lot of that's about taking unusual paths. In mm. a way, you took an unusual path by taking the most usual path every parent wants for their kids ever. <laughs> it's like, can I check multiple parents' boxes with my college education, not hey, just mine? I tried violin. I did not. I could not compete in violin. Science fair debate, some of the other ones. Um, so I grew up in Florida in a, a kind of a sleepy beach town, went to a magnet high school and did not grow up around people that went to fancy schools. I didn't know a lot about fancy schools. I did really well in the SATs and got a letter from Princeton and said, we'd love to come show you around. Uh, really unexpected. I knew of Princeton because of Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And <laughs> I had never been to the state of New Jersey. And- You were missing out. It, uh, it's an amazing state. And so um, got to go to Princeton and then uh, to, to tick through it. So go to Princeton, was in the Woodrow Wilson School there, which is our school of public policy. Uh, went to work in Washington, D.C. at the White House on Capitol Hill. Then went to Yale to go to Divinity School. Uh, the old line is, you know, at Harvard Divinity School, no one believes in God. And at Yale Divinity School, everyone believes in God and they know she's amazing. And uh, it was a really interesting place. And then uh, went to work at Facebook and started a company and then went to business school at Harvard. So I, I checked the big three, which was not my family story, not my expected story, 
broadly, they are amazing institutions with the kinds of faculty that have devoted their lives to the study of something. And in a few occasions to uh, sit with Cornell West and Robbie George and be in a freshman seminar with these giants of critical thinking who disagree on almost everything and to sit there in a beautiful old building with lead pane windows and just see brilliance in front of you and be taught. There's something magical about these places. It really is that like dream, right? For so many people, like can, it's the ultimate sign of success. Mm -hmm. I, my kid got into Harvard. Do you think that that's still valid as a graduate of three of the top universities for different, in different ways or, you know, as a parent yourself, you have four kids. Have you thought differently about that? I think one line that, I mean, Peter Thiel would say about the only thing that's good about going to Harvard is really having gotten into Harvard. And so the sense to which getting into these schools vis-a-vis -vis some test score proxy may have some other proxy to IQ or something. It's sort of a potential indicator that this is someone who works hard and can think critically about things. I think I was, you know, in these schools in sort of, what, 2001 to 2012, and we were beginning to see some of these things of, of silly things being taught, but for the most part, they were electives. And so if you fought for it, you could take the core courses, you could study Shakespeare, you could do quantum physics, you could do the engineering courses in Western civilization, but you had to kind of know what to look for. I don't follow it super closely now, but my sense is that those courses are certainly not required anymore. In many cases, they're not even accessible. Hmm. So I think, I do worry about kids coming out of these universities today to just think, you know, what have they been taught? A mentor, David French, has sued the most number of universities of any lawyer in America. He's an amazing person. And <laughs> he sort of comments that Early on, it was like in the 90s, it was the faculty that was sort of the avant-garde of, of the cutting edge of pushing various weird forms of philosophies. Then in the aughts, it was the, the academics and the administration who would sort of roll out all these programs. And now they've created such an ecosystem that both of those entities are afraid of now the real culprit, which is the students. So the students are the leaders of these really weird ideology. So I'm worried about it now. Um, I'm still glad that I, I got to go. I think one frame that I really found interesting, uh, David Brooks had written the Bobos in Paradise piece and then his wonderful piece in the Atlantic on the organization kid. And it was actually written about Princeton students. And it's famously the university with the most number of student groups. You know, every kid's got to have a student group and be an officer of all these different things. The best critique is in Zero to One, the Blake Masters Peter book, and they are talking about Rhodes Scholars, and they say this about Rhodes Scholars, every Rhodes Scholar had a great future in his past. And this happened with all the Princeton kids. You know, you get into Princeton, you're gonna change the world. You could do anything you want. You're in the elite of the elite. Cure AIDS and economic development in Asia, I mean, whatever. And the line about the Rhodes Scholars really saying, where are these Rhodes Scholars now? They are partners at Goldman, they are partners at Covington. They're in the most sort of status-oriented profession that Peter would argue like contribute very little to society. So there is something about, Ellie Luna has this thing, she talks about being should on your whole life. You know, you should go to work at Facebook, you should do all these things. Being should on being your should whole on. life. <laughs> That's she a good should one. on her whole life. And then finally, once she shifted from that being should on to then ask the question, what is it that I must do? That sort of wild-eyed thing that sometimes manifests in entrepreneurs is I think the thing that, you know, some of these elite institutions, everyone's sort of fighting to be lowest common denominator in the form of, I've got to get the job at McKinsey, or I really want to be a lawyer, or I really want to go to Goldman. We didn't even know what those things were, but everyone around you says, you know, this is the right thing to do. This is the way to be credentialed. And those jobs aren't terrible jobs, but I think more people really finding in themselves, what is that thing that I must do and I think we'd all be better off if there were more people asking that question at these universities. One of the things that I find so interesting about the path uh, that you've taken in going through these schools is that you didn't go down that road because it is, it does seem like, and I wanna come back to your statements about like culture creation because it seems like when you go into school, that community that you're, you're embedded in and that you sort of come up through is maybe the biggest value component of the experience itself. Right. You know, I've interviewed a lot of people, especially Brian Kaplan, who's like, aside from getting a stamp, there's no residual like human capital investment you get. Maybe if you take engineering. 
Right. But otherwise, it's really like a stamp, like you said, that, okay, you're, you've got some conscientiousness and you're willing to see things through and finish it. And then it's your social network. Mm. So talk to me a little more about the, that, that philosophy that helped you start Teneo, mm. this notion of this, this sort of elite culture engine. Yeah, because that, that's actually kind of a it's, it's kind of a controversial claim to make today. You know, we have mm. so much anti elite mindset out there for right. for a fair amount of good reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Being against or for elites is actually a, a separate question than answering an empirical claim, which is really how is culture created? And the two competing theories might be at the most general level. Culture is bottom up. And so there's a, a swell among the people for a new kind of film or a new kind of music, and it's very organic. And then over time, the, the creators are responding to that groundswell. Then there's sort of the top-down approach, which says people with disproportionate access to various kinds of capital are the leaders of stoking and driving change that the masses later consume. There are wonderful sociologists, uh, Thorsten Veblen, Max Weber, uh, Bourdieu, Marx, uh, Randall Collins as the only living one, a professor at Harvard, who it's both theory, but it's also empirical. And so they look at, in this book called Sociology of Philosophies, which just unpack that. So sociology, sort of the study of societies, yep. of philosophies of love of knowledge. And so it's asking how do schools of thought become more or less popular over time? And so he's really trying to answer the question empirically, studying specific times when an idea that began on the fringe of society becomes mainstream over time. What is the pathway for that? I agree with those sociologists. They say that it is a, it's largely a top-down. We see this empirically. And if you believe that about how culture is formed, there are some specific uh, tools or instruments that you might use to stitch some of that stuff together. And all that might seem, might even be, Machiavellian and dangerous if what you're trying to roll out is stuff that leads people not to flourish. If you have some, I would say, uh, Marxism is, is kind of no bueno for most people, um, but if you have some ideology that's really good for you or really bad for other people and you roll it out, this would be a really bad thing. Yeah. But if we have a- Communism, a, Nazism. If we have some view, I think some of this that we share, there's some, some general insights about ways that people can live together that lead to their flourishing. If you go with that set of values into these institutions and execute some of these plans, oh my gosh, we can, we can unleash global human flourishing in like a totally new way. So my general hunch is that people that think about the kind of human flourishing that we're excited about either don't spend time thinking about cultural creation or learn a little bit and they say that's sort of not my bailiwick. One of my favorite ones is this study called, wait for it, it's called the comparative advantage of filling structural holes. So this guy, right. uh, this computer scientist does this thing where he asks the question, who is the most valuable person at IBM? And this is like okay. pre-internet days. So literally thinking about buildings and people and how they navigate buildings. And what he found was there was this woman, this chatty woman who sat on the edge of her department physically, like there were cubicles. Right. And she would like go to the water cooler and she'd like wander downstairs. And because she was in this overlapping network of different business functions at IBM, she was like the central node where all information flowed through. And so if you think about that, you could apply that to how we live, right? So you make movies and if, most people are homophilic. We spend time with people that are like ourselves. And so that's by race and gender and age and vocation. So you might spend a lot of time with people like that. But this theory about this friendly woman on the perimeter at IBM says, actually, no, like you really need some investment banker friends and you need some elected officials and some policymakers and some journalist friends. And if you have friends like that, it means that you have really quick access through weak ties and strong ties to kind of wrecking shop for whatever you're excited about. Quick example, so imagine four people sitting at the Harvard Club in New York City. Let's say one is a uh, editor at the New York Times, one's a professor of gender at Harvard, one's a filmmaker, and one's a billionaire. And the billionaire says, I think it would be really cool if we had free sex change therapy available for all kids in America. Let's just say that was his passion, right? So sure. what happened? So the Harvard professor says, well, we can do some kind of quasi-empirical studies and sort of show that this is really great for the kids. New York Times says, let's do a whole set of stories about how this actually frees kids to be the gender that they were made to be and really hold them out as kind of heroes becoming who they were made to be. And the filmmaker's like, well, I'll start working on a you know blockbuster story about maybe some kid stuck in an evangelical home who wasn't allowed to be the gender he was supposed to be and how repression in America is alive and well. That's at a lunch. So you take those four people together and the ability for them to go out and just wreck shop 
for that set of ideas because in that particular case, they're engaging academia, media, film, and they have a financier. Are some of the building blocks that would let someone with an idea really accelerate its pervasiveness into society. One of the things that strikes me about that is that we have this educational path that gets in increasingly narrow the longer you stay in school. Like, so you went through a lot of school and yet you came out sort of diversifying the ways you're interacting with people. Mm. But for, for a lot of people to go in school, they become narrower and narrower in their focus and their specialty. And it seems like you have to really consciously cultivate that kind of interaction, that kind mm. of network, right? Mm. Because it isn't in our nature, probably, mm. to stay connected to so many different kinds of people. Like, mm. where would you start? Yeah, well, I would probably start by thinking about you know, what ideas am I really excited about? Some people take into their own personal mission uh, some form of evangelism, or that's actually about the gospel, or just evangelism, you love a sports team, or you like half zip sweaters or whatever it is. So if you have that thing, then we're on a mission. We're gonna like bring this to other people. In terms of stitching together the network that would help you do that, which could be a kind of a side hustle. If you're an entrepreneur, it's really around your company, right? So building networks of people are incredibly valuable to making companies possible, raising capital, recruiting people, product feedback, et cetera. And I might begin with kind of an audit of who you are. So if, except it's true, we are homophilic. So think through, you know, your age and your race and your gender and where you went to school and where you live and uh, where you spend time on the internet, what kind of news you read. And just assume that you're, you know, probably pretty well networked in that sphere of people. And then I'd ask, okay, what kinds of people would be really helpful to the sort of work that you're doing? I think intentional side hustles can be great surface area to meet people out of your line of work. So let's say you live in Austin, Texas, and you are a senior operations manager working at Dropbox, right? So you kind of know tech people. Joining the board of a local nonprofit could be an interesting way that even if you don't personally love the mission of the nonprofit, it's just sort of added surface area. You could be involved in the alumni association of your university. You could take an intellectual interest in something and start tweeting or writing a blog about it and ask to interview people. When I was working at Facebook, I, without uh, any authorization, uh, organized a sort of internal executive speaker series. And so I just emailed all the execs and copied <laughs> their assistant. I said, you know, hey, Zuck, is available one of these three weeks, which one works the best for his schedule. And so we kind of ran this internal speaking series and, and HR people were like, where's this event series coming from? And <laughs> it's like, he booked it, I don't know, let's just do the thing. And so um, there are ways to sort of be creative in side hustles to just give yourself more access. I'm really glad you asked about that because there's this great book called Never Eat Alone by Keith Ferrazzi. And there's some weird things in the book that I would probably not encourage doing. But he talks a lot about you know, when you increase your, your luck surface area, more deals come your way. And so he really challenges you to think about this. He argues that most interesting things, most of the most interesting things that will come to you in your life, they will come to you. You do not originate them. You may start a few, but someone calls you an invitation. Let's take this trip together. Let's start this company. Let's invest, whatever. So then you kind of back him. You say, well, why would the deal have come to you? Why would someone think John's the guy that does this thing? And the apparatus you'd build to sort of lubricate that, you know, those inbounds, those leads really about opportunities in life is first to build a brand. I'll be like, oh, I don't have a brand that's so kind of commercial. Well, mm -hmm. people that say things like that, they have a brand, they just don't know it. And it's probably not very good. So what is your brand? Let's define what that brand is. John loves these kind of political ideas, making documentaries and whatever. Legos. Then, Legos, yeah, he loves <laughs> Legos. Um, so you got this brand, so let's define the brand. And then let's think about how can you stay top of mind among people who are most likely to have cool opportunities for you. So in your business case, you guys make really amazing documentary films. How would people be reminded that this is what you do such that when they have a thought and they meet someone who needs someone that you're like you, because you're excellent at it, they're like, oh, you got to call John, right? So it kind right. of backs you in a little bit of like, okay, what am I about? What do I want to be known for? And then how can I, in, in not weird ways, make that kind of lightly known? on social media, in conversations or whatever. Last thing on this, I spend time with a lot of lawyers. I'm married to one, <laughs> it's okay. And what I noticed about so many young lawyers especially is they're sort of embarrassed by what they do. You know, you ask them, uh, well, you know, what kind of work are you in? And it's this classic, it's like, um, I'm at Wilson. Or like they look down, they're like, Sam, like you busted your butt getting to this great law school and getting this fancy job, like own it, you know? But 
I hear you. You don't want to talk about corporate transactions. You need a thing. And the thing is probably not what you spend your days doing. And so I enjoy thinking with people about what is their thing. And it's some sort of like weird hobby that you're interested in, some idea, some set of books, some hobby or something. And uh, that can be great service area, even just a cocktail party conversation. Like, what are you involved in? My father-in-law teaches me that, especially when talking with all kinds of people. It's a great question. Don't say, what do you do? Yeah. What keeps you busy or what are you involved in? And so if you're asked that question, uh, where are you going to drive that conversation? The thing that strikes me is that deciding to be an entrepreneur, deciding to try to start a company or an organization, we already talked about, like, you know, you started Teneo, but I want to talk about some of the other companies mm -hmm. and about how you think about entrepreneurship, because it's a weird thing to decide that that's what you're going to be about. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, and it's not, an, it's not all that well-defined culturally at some level. Right. It's like, well, what, what is it? What's the job? Yeah. So growing up, I knew very few people in business. So coming into college, when I thought business person, I thought car dealer. <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to sell cars, so I don't want to do business. I thought, you know, the world of shaping where the country goes is really about politics or policy or law. Uh, that's sort of where influence happens. I just hadn't really been exposed to it. And, I, and why did you want to do that? What mm. was it in you that was saying, I mm. want to shape the country? I mean, I know for me, I was always fairly politically minded. Like we're doing right. the show. It's called Dad Saves America. It's yeah. not just like dad, be a great dad. Because yeah. I care about that. But yeah. what about you? Like. What was, hmm. what was the seed of that passion? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. My parents on my birthday card every year would write the following refrain, where did he come from, question mark, which just spoke <laughs> to like makes it being a little bit weird, but also just having this sense of wanting to shape things around me, the sense that a lot of the world was broken and that through creative doing and leading, you could, you could improve that. I just didn't think of business as a tool for that. And so it's really meeting Peter Thiel years later that it reframed how I thought about business. Um, and how did you meet Peter? I was a debater in, in high school and college, and then I joined the debate society at Yale. And a friend through that said, there's this guy coming in town. Why don't you join us for dinner? Peter Thiel. And I said, who was that? I had no idea who he was. This is a long time ago. And the guy said, well, there's only... There's one thing, though, before we have the dinner, you must read these three books by Rene Girard, which is a, a very high entry price into a dinner. This all sounds very Ivy League. <laughs> yeah. Well, and Rene Girard is, uh, is special. It's, it's kind of really hard to get through. But Peter shattered how I thought about business in the following way. There was this book in the 1990s called Halftime from Success to Significance. And it shaped how a lot of sort of Christian boomers who were in business thought about what are they going to do with their life? So imagine someone who had had some financial success and the subtitle yeah. of the book says, we're going to take you from your success to now having significance. Basically what they meant was now giving your money away. Okay. Right. I think yeah. charity and philanthropy yeah. is, is really awesome, but it plays into the idea that business is good only because it produces wealth for the owners. And then with that wealth, they do, they go do good things. I learned the founding story of Palantir, which I didn't know. I'll share briefly. So these are like these three nerds sitting around and they watched the attack on the Twin Towers. Yeah. And many people had this moment of, what do I do? What, what could I do? They were probably not able to go enlist in the Marines. And they just started <laughs> thinking like their unique contribution was they could build a company based on a lot of their work and growing PayPal that would make the U.S. intelligence services dramatically more effective at stopping terrorism. And so it's such a cool, like, I see a problem, and then I start a company to fix the problem, which is, on the one hand, very obvious, but is totally a radical thought today. You talk to, you know, seniors 25 years ago in college, I think the save the world means to go to the Peace Corps. Right. Probably yeah. 10 years ago, it was join Teach for America. And today, I don't know, community organizer or something, what they think about doing is they might think about government or nonprofits or some sort of public service. And those can be good things. Something fundamentally altruistic. Right. And they think of business as sort of part of the problem. And Peter, in his example of Palantir, and then now many hundreds of companies I've gotten to study and think about, the founder has chosen to build usually a venture-backed, technology-enabled business because as a mode of forming and organizing capital, so computers and code and brains and labor and money, so you're organizing these various forms of capital, 
when you do it in a venture back startup, it has a potential for explosive growth and the ability to dramatically solve that problem. So for example, there's a KIPP. Everyone thinks about charter schools. So KIPP yep. is an amazing model. It's a nonprofit model and a lot of money has to be raised to launch new schools. In their peak, I think they launched about five schools in a year around the country, which takes a ton of nonprofit dollars. There's a company called New Globe in Africa that this year will launch about 4,000 schools. Wow. It's a venture back really? company. It's technology. It's people working 80 hours a week in a culture. And so I just reached that decision and in, in insight on my own through a lot of people coaching me, but I want to evangelize that to other people. It's, you know, when you see whatever problem you're talking about, whether it's loneliness or obesity, any of these things that you see, at least one of the tools you should have in your toolkit to think about is how could a, a business and potentially a venture backed business be a tool used to solve this problem? The mindset there is so powerful because when I think about you know, as a dad, what do I want my, my son? I have, you know, as you know, I have one son, Mateo. What do I want him to be thinking about? Like, how do I want him to ultimately develop a mindset that sets him up to, to get the most out of life? Mm -hmm. I think about these two things that really are embedded in what you're talking about. And that is like, does he have a sense that he's got agency, that he's, mm -hmm. his choices matter? Right. And that he can make choices, that he's got yeah. that autonomy to make the choices for, his, for himself. Mm -hmm. He's not a victim of circumstance. And that he's got a growth mindset, that change yeah. is possible, not just, in the, not just in himself, but in the world. Right. Because I look at the, the negativity and the nihilism that's out there in our culture, and it feels like those are the two mindsets that are inverted mm. when you go down that sort of dark road that, oh, we're doomed, uh, everything's broken beyond repair. So how do you think about the mindset of mm. entrepreneurship? You know, mm. what, what, is that, what does that mean to you? Mm. Fundamentally, in an entrepreneur, a definition which I love is uh, marshalling resources beyond your immediate control. So I think of like a little boy in a sandbox and there's no toys around him, but like in the adjacent sandboxes, there's like a little dump truck, there's a shovel, and you're kind of like eyeing around and you're like, I got to get me some of those toys into my sandbox. And so you're marshalling these resources, not all founders, but many, the wealth that they may generate through building the venture is really sort of a an enabling agent. It's sort of the, the capitalization of the company allows the scaling of the mission. And there's often some mission that they are on to, to change the world. So I think there's a, there's a hope in, uh, in the entrepreneurial spirit that you'll have down days because venture building is really hard. We had a board member who said, uh, entrepreneurship has this great British accent, which I won't force on you, but he says, entrepreneurship is you wake up in the morning and you lunge yourself forward and you fall flat on your face. And the guy who wins is the guy who can get up and do it fastest the next day. <laughs> and so if you think about building a venture, you're just like uh, throwing yourself. And we love the Teddy Roosevelt line about the man in the arena. And, and in that particular case, you're literally getting bloodied and bruised. And so most founders don't actually have that happen. But metaphorically, I mean, the impact of building a company on your mental health, on your marriage, on your finances. I mean, most companies don't work. You're broke for a really long time. New data out on mental health issues facing founders. I mean, it's really, we look at someone like Elon and think about fancy houses or boats or yachts or whatever, and there's a huge toll that it takes to be sort of in the arena. And uh, in little ways, I wanna be on the sidelines of that, and in some cases in the arena too, but at the very least, cheering these people on to say, I'll bring you water, I will wipe, wipe your brow, let's uh, care for you while you're, you're doing this heroic act. So you got in the arena several times. When we first met, you were working on this and it was awesome. It was this company called Outbox. Mm -hmm. And well, what, what did Outbox do? Outbox was a service for consumers. When you sign up, you would never go to your mailbox again. We had a partnership so that we'd intercept all your physical mail and you would get just the mail that mattered to you, wedding announcements, bills, checks, delivered to you on your phone, your iPad, wherever you wanted. If you got a wedding invitation or something that you wanted a physical copy of, you could request it and once a week you'd get a packet of just the mail that you wanted. So think of like kind of the Google voice for postal mail. That was the basic. And what, what, how did this idea come about? Because I mean, obviously, 
I just went to the mail this morning and most of it was trash. Like yeah. Literally trash. Like, oh, it's it's trash day, so I don't even need to go back to my house. I can take the yeah. mail from my mailbox. Yeah. Okay, there's three things I might use and the rest can go right to the recycle bin. Absolutely. Which will, of course, end up in the trash because yeah. recycling is mostly a scam. But well, um, well, pro tip, direct mailers are very good at making you think that you're getting something valuable. But you can always look at the top right-hand corner and if you see either the full phrase pre-sort or P-R-S-T, it must mean that it's not important. A bank or an entity can't send you something important in pre-sort. So just glance, if it says pre-sort, just throw it away, never open it. See, that's all you need. So <laughs> that, was it. that was the company, my, uh, do that for you. My, my co-founder was a really good friend, Will Davis, and we had worked in Washington DC together, we were in business school together, and we were both students of Clayton Christensen, who coined the phrase disruptive innovation, but really built a whole way of thinking about business. And when you say students, do you mean like literally he was a teacher or just students in the sense of like you followed his ideas? Both. He later died of cancer and had sort of started a class that semester and then like couldn't teach it. So we had sort of gotten into the class but then weren't able to take it. He kind of would give some guest lectures. He's sort of this huge figure around Harvard Business School. And in it, he lays out a method for how new market entrants can kind of take down the giants. And there's a few different pathways to do that. And so a little bit as a, as a heuristic for how do you come up with an idea? Some people are born with an idea. They have something they've always been working on. We had some kind of interesting ideas. So Will's heuristic to kind of get to this was, is there a way that you could build a new market entrant that has a possibility of like cannibalizing or eventually taking over a federal agency that's completely failing? And so you could uh, do this mapping activity and think about ag or the CIA or whatever. And the Postal Service on a number of criteria emerged as a, as a ripe target. Right. An $18 billion deficit. Everybody hates it. No technology. <laughs> and Will was kind of kicking this idea around and, and brought me into the conversation really early. I had taken a job to go back and work at Facebook. And so he had this fun, right after business school, a summer in Boston. We were still there. And we sort of had this like, all right, we have 60 days to get to some version of like, am I going to go take this job or not? And uh, my wife, my poor wife, she had an awesome job lined up in San Francisco. But like, if we did the company, we'd have no money. We had a baby at the time. I mean, it was, there was a lot going on. And she was amazingly supportive. She was like, let's think about a number. It was a small number, but like an amount of money that we say you could spend on working on this concept this summer. And we had defined a few things. A lot of people would say, could we raise money? We had not had that as a, as a defining point for us that quickly. We set some targets around how many customer interviews could we do with a minimal viable product, kind of a paper prototype model. And if we thought we got positive feedback from enough customers, we'd say, this is a business worth doing. So, so explain to me what that means, a paper prototype, minimum viable. So for, for somebody who isn't familiar with some of this yeah. lingo. We had some hunches on what we thought the customer would want in terms of what the broad product was and what features of the product would be interesting to people. And there's a school of thought called the Lean Startup written by this guy, Eric Ries. And it's a really cool way to think about getting feedback on product ideas without actually building products, in many cases, without building anything. And so the model here would be a paper prototype or quickly then we built like an iPad prototype, but there's no software involved. And so the basics of the product would be, we'd go to someone's house, we would have asked them to kind of stack their mail and not look at it for the last week. And then we would do this very rudimentary, like imagine this is your iPad. Imagine this piece of mail is on your iPad digitally. What would you do to it? Where would you touch on the screen? Hmm. And so you use physical artifacts, sometimes paper, sometimes sketches. You can draw stuff out. Here's the button, you know, and you ask questions like, well, you just hit that button. What do you, what would you expect to happen after you hit that button? Just kind of a way of running interviews to get people's insights on stuff. So it's like they hit that button and they're like, oh, I think that should automatically delete the thing. Hmm. And we're like, oh, we thought it meant just advance to the next one and left it in your inbox. So it's just a quick way of learning quickly without having to hire yeah. engineers or, or designers. So we had enough positive feedback by the end of the summer. We're like, let's, let's do this thing. And so we decided to put the company in Austin, Texas, instead of California. Will had ties to Texas. Texas felt on the cutting edge. and You we weren't said, living in Texas at that point? We were in Boston, okay. just finishing up business school, and we're open. I <laughs> uh, didn't have strong <laughs> thoughts on it. We were like, Texas sounds really cool. So we come to Texas and we say, let's go raise capital. So we're going to raise some venture capital. Yep. And we go pitch. Was this where this network, this sort of elite network of yours, of like Peter Thiel and 
and and these awesome schools yeah. kick, really kicks in. Yeah, I think having gone to those schools it gets you in the door. So you pass the sniff test. It's like, okay, they probably checked some kind of box. Let's look at the thing. But then like what you build actually has to work. So it kind of gets you in the door and then and then you pitch. And so standard for this is you're putting together a pitch deck. So some slides that lay out what the business is and how the business works and who's on the team and how you acquire customers. And then you put together this roadshow to go get in front of investors, usually venture capitalists or angel investors. And you're essentially selling part of your company saying, here's how we're going to change the world and we need your money and we're going to 100x the money that you give us. So what happens next? So we go on this roadshow. I think we probably pitched about 50 investors and we got a lot of no's. And it's actually really common to get a lot of no's. One thing that's really valuable is a quick no. A uh, slow no is very bad. You really want a quick yes, but a quick no is actually really good as well. And also, how do you make sense of the no? What a privilege it is to go meet some of the smartest people in the world that are great at building companies. Tell them exactly what your plan is and for them to give you like the three reasons there's no way in hell it's going to work. <laughs> you know, how, how cool, right? Like you didn't even have to pay them for the advice. You just, you know, showed up <laughs> in their office for an hour for them to yell at you. Other people had, I don't know, all sorts of concerns. Like uh, a lot of these, it's kind of interesting, a lot of these people we pitched have staff that deal with their mail. So they actually don't know a lot about mail. <laughs> so it's just kind of funny. Their personal experience is what like. What is this problem you're talking about? Junk mail? Who gets mail these days? <laughs> it's like, uh... Ask your, you know, assistant or whatever how much mail you get. So pretty much always in software-related companies, the two big things to figure out are your customer acquisition cost. So how are you bringing customers in? You're spending money, you're doing marketing sales activities to bring them in the door. How much does it cost you to do that? And then your lifetime value of the customer, which is how much revenue do you extract from them over the duration you have them um, as an active customer? Those are really the two kind of pillars of figuring out those early stage business models. So we got a lot of no's, but you only need a few yeses. So I think we had about $1.4 million raised. We were gonna raise about 1.5, so we're almost there. And then we finally got into a meeting with Mike Maples, who is this legendary venture capitalist, this is kind of... Why is his name so familiar to me? Because I don't know the venture world all, all that well. Yeah, is, so... Is, is, does, does he have like a prior company or <clears throat> ventures that were really like exciting for him to be a part of it? Mike Maple Sr. was the CTO of Microsoft for a long time. Oh, okay. And then, so he's sort of a big name out there. And Mike Maples Jr. built Motive, took this enterprise software company public. So he makes all this money in 2005 and he's like, I'm going to be a venture capitalist. And so he goes out to Silicon Valley and there, there's, there's money everywhere. No one will take his money. Right, there is this, the markets are so flush. And so he finally finds this company to invest in called Odeo and he wires the money. He's like, I got my first deal. So like within a month, the CEO calls him and says, this was a podcasting company, okay? And uh, he says, iTunes just launched a podcast program platform. It's gonna totally destroy our business. We're just shutting it down. We had not really completed the route. I'm just gonna send the money back to you. Oh. <laughs> and he was like, my first investment. So he literally says, he says, are you working on anything else? Like, do you have any other concepts? And so this guy goes, fumbles through this like micro posting, like didn't understand. He was like, just, just go build that. That was Twitter. So that's how Mike became the first investor in Twitter. Mike's takeaway from that, Mike has lots of great nuggets of wisdom and he was on our board and just became a friend and coach over a long time. But in that one, obviously he's really demonstrating his belief that it's all about the team. So much so that like, he didn't even care what the new product was. He just liked who the people were and then the process they had built to help discover new products. So Mike says, okay, I want the whole thing. And we're like, we've got 1.4 million. What are we going to do? And so we, we, we cram people down and raise more. And so close that first round with Mike coming into the round. I was a customer. So uh -huh. we met and you told me about the thing. And I said, well, that sounds amazing. I'm going to sign up immediately. Yeah. And I did. And for a time in 2012, 2013, yeah. whenever that was, yep. it was great. Yeah. It was like, oh my gosh, I don't have to go to my mailbox. Right. Oh, junk, 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 keep yeah. open. Yeah. And every so often it's like, I'll have that physically. Bloop. Yeah. Amazing. What happens? That was the product. So we were launching in a few different markets and we had these regional partnerships with the Postal Service. It's a very regulated space. It's like federal law protects mail from when it goes to the mailbox to when the recipient opens the mail. There's a postal SWAT team. Okay, don't mess the Postal Service. Isn't it technically like a 
felony if you yeah. like go to if I go to my neighbor's mailbox and take stuff out of their mail, yeah. I'm like committing a, like a federal crime. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So you were technically a business that could be con could be viewed as federally criminal. Yeah. So we did it with <laughs> with their permission. Uh, <laughs> we we tested a little bit and then got their permission. We had this partnership. So we get this call from the postmaster general. It was like a year and a half into the thing, and he says, "I want you guys to come to Washington D.C." So we're envisioning the ultimate business development. This is going to be great. Champagne, national rollout. So we get to the top floor of L'Enfant Plaza, which is the saddest federal building. It has like a fake Louvre sort of glass <laughs> triangle thing. <laughs> we're in the top floor windowless conference room. And in there we have the chief of operations, the head of digital, and the postmaster general himself goes by the general. They knew all what we were up to. And so we're like, hey, great to be here. You know, So we're going for this round of feedback. So the head of ops says, there's no way that operationally this will work. And we were like, well, it's kind of already working in a bunch of places. And then the head of digital, whose previous job had been, he was the head of the union of letter carrier unions, like the, like the Uber union, okay? And he said- A hub of innovation, a yeah, hub of so tech he, innovation. He says, he says uh, there's no way this will work because digital is a fad. And his job is the head of digital <laughs> innovation. We're like, Wait, what does that even mean? This is- 20, what year? Is this 2013? Uh, yeah, about, yeah. So 2013 digital is a fad. Is a fad. Yeah, yeah. But what is, did you have any, know, any idea what we that just, meant? We didn't even know. What do you even <laughs> say to that? Like, uh, good, good point. So <laughs> we uh, then get to the general, who's a, real, he's a smart guy, and he says, uh, here's the deal. The people that you're serving are the American citizens, and those are not our customer. Our customer are the volume mailers and our product to those junk mailers is the guaranteed delivery of their junk mail onto the kitchen tables of Americans. And because of that, we can't work with you guys. And so we're like, awkward silence. What do you say? Like, thank you for telling me how horrible of a person you are. So we obviously did not expect that coming. And we, we kind of fumbled around the conversation a little bit, but he was like pretty matter of fact about that is what their business is. So we're pulling and, the plug, um, you're done. I sometimes would later think about it as like, I've heard, I've not seen it, I've heard in North Korea, they like installed uh, like radio speakers on the wall in every kitchen. So like the dear leader can always just like intercom into all the houses. It's like, that's how the postal service thinks about your kitchen table. It's like, no, I have those, uh, you know, 200 square inches right there. That's my space. I I'm, mar that. I'm marketing to you. So you were the enemy of Newman, and Newman fought back and won. It's the yeah. it's Newman fights back. So we have Newman this, strikes we have, back. We have this kind of crazy grand finale of this thing. We have some money left. There's no way that we can do this without the Postal Service. And we go to our board and say, all right, we're just going to give you the money, but what is left over, we'll give it back. And Mike, a la his Twitter experience, he says, guys, you built a really cool team. Keep the money and go build something else. We're like, all right. Let's do it. So then we had the craziest 16 weeks or so of this sort of weekly sprint on, we call it New Business Mondays. And uh, we just, like, we had some spaces we were curious about and we would just kind of ran this really wild process and then settled on a, a small business lending product at the end of that, which is sort of the founding story of Able, which is the next company. You got good at doing these pitches mm. and you wrote this book, Get Backed. What is the essence of a great pitch? And I don't mean this just for a business. Mm. I mean this sort of in general. I think about this a lot because I like pitching. Mm. And I actually think that everything you do all the time fundamentally is about pitching. You're having to be persuasive. You're having to decide, you should go on a date with me. You're making a pitch. Absolutely. So how do you think about pitching? What is the essential mm. core of a great pitch? Mm. I think about it in, in, in two levels, and I want to focus on the second one, because I think people often think of the first. The first level is actually what words and images and data are literally on the slides, right, that articulate uh, the research and the facts. And that's, that's important. But what's amazing in our process of collecting hundreds of decks of some of the biggest companies, some of the companies that became the most valuable had the absolute worst pitch decks we've ever seen. <laughs> And what it taught me was that there's this other layer of what's actually happening in a pitch, which is really an invitation to someone else to be in relationship, hmm. right? It's, I've got these slides that I've worked on that explain all the complexity and all the time I've spent on this thing. Here's my total addressable market right. and how much money, oh, if we just get 1% of China, we'll be billionaires. All these things, competition, team, what you're gonna use the money for, et cetera. But actually often in, in pitches, in most pitches when you're 
actually spending time with an investor, you're not actually even going through your slide deck. You sort of sent the deck over ahead of time as sort of the excuse to spend time together. And part of what some investors are doing is actually, it's almost like improv and play. And it's like, I'm gonna see how this person thinks. So I'm gonna push you really hard on your acquisition model, not because I'm certain that you're wrong, but just to see how you think about it. Because especially in investing at the earliest stages, we know that what you're investing in is not what you have just told me. Not because you're lying, but it's absolutely gonna change because you're gonna learn from the market and learn from customers. So I'm, I'm more curious at that higher level, that level of play, of, of invitation, of storytelling. And we love the hero's journey and sort of that arc of sort of, I'm on, this amazing quest to solve this problem that you also agree with. And then along the way, I ran into this really difficult situation. You enter that empathy with me, but wait, there's a unique way, a unique path forward to still reach the promised land. And that is only something that you, Mr. Investor, can be a part of. And so pulling forward the, the hero's journey story uh, in a way that they feel uniquely sought after, that it's not just your money, it's uniquely who you are and what we get to do together and that I think you know, pulls not just on the brain, but pulls on the heart. One of our digital marketing team members told me a heuristic, like a mental model hmm. for decision-making that really resonates with that. And he called it the decision sandwich. And he said, look, hmm. here's the way people make decisions. The bread is rational. We frame our decision with our deck. Okay, here's the rational hmm. framework. Okay, now I can evaluate the decision I'm gonna make. After we make the decision, we ex post rationalize it again here's why i did it because of this and because mm. of the opportunity cost and because of the possible return and whatever right but at the center the, the meat or the peanut butter and jelly whatever you prefer of the sandwich is fundamentally the emotional choice your gut mm. i just feel this is the right thing to do mm. i feel this is the right person to be with i feel this is the right job to take yeah. the right city to move to yeah or, you know yeah so if that's true and i think there's there's a lot to that how do you orchestrate, not in a manipulative way, in a genuine way, that emotional connection. I'm kind of always fundraising for something else. And uh, my latest trick, no, it's not a trick. It's a, it's a tactic. It's an approach. So I get told no a lot, right? And the more money you're trying to raise, the more no's you get, you get them all the time. So uh, I just mailed out this last week, a bunch of copies of one of my favorite books called Thanks for the Feedback. Everyone that told me no, I wrote them a handwritten note just saying that it, you know, one of the highest compliments is a hearty and well-articulated no. And sharing with you one of my favorite books on the subject, Evan, and I uh, mailed that out to uh, a lot of people. I got told no a lot of, a lot of times. <laughs> but it's like, you know, my hunch is like, no one has ever done anything like that before. And so it doesn't take a lot of time. And it's just really seeing all these bids, seeing all these emails or asks or whatever as uh, their bids to ask you to play. Certainly it's more fun to think about it that way. And I think in certain cases it can, it can move the needle. And it is about raising money, but like you were saying, whether it's asking someone on a date, it's uh, we have a builder right now that I wanna strangle. And you've got this relationship <laughs> with this person and you're trying to get them to do something. Your neighbor keeps having their dog crap on their lawn. You know, all kinds of ways you're trying to persuade other people. And I think a, a little spirit of bid spirit of play, a spirit of improv are areas that I wasn't really born with, but kind of have picked up and I think are really valuable. But I want to move on to the other side, the business of life. Mm. Because one of the things I've noticed and and gotten to know about you is that you're, you're, you're incredibly good at managing what is a very stacked life in a way mm. that is impressive. Mm. And I want to try to crack that open and understand it a little bit, because I think as dads, we face a lot of competing pressures for our time and our energy mm. and how to balance, especially if you're going to be a, 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 in, in business or in an entrepreneurial or a high pressure role. It's so hard to know when you're over investing in one area of your life mm. to, to a detriment that you're going to regret. You know, yeah. nobody went to, you know, what's the saying? It's like nobody went to their deathbed saying, I wish I had more stuff. Right. You have five Fs mm -hmm. that you've talked about that are, I think, a framework for balancing yeah. your life. Yeah. And I, I'd like to just walk th through those with you. Like, what yeah. are these five Fs? How do you use that as a tool for not letting these business ventures and these exciting change the world ideas mm. kind of swamp everything else? Yeah. Well, the five F framework is uh, something I picked up after having my first kid. And I think coming into fatherhood, I assumed that it would be a new compartmentalized workflow. 
<laughs> and uh, I've learned a lot about kids. I think Anne Lamott says, it's like, I was an amazing parent until I had children. It's just like <laughs> brutal. And so our, our first son is born the first week of business school and he had colic. And our pediatrician said, if you treat colic, it lasts for 12 weeks. If you don't treat it, it lasts for three months. So you can't treat colic. <laughs> was it my grandfather? Uh, was, your, it, was the pediatrician? It's like, okay, if I give you medicine, you'll be sick for a week. If I don't, you'll be sick for seven days. <laughs> totally, totally. <laughs> And so, uh, so, so colic is a Latin word for screaming your head off. Um, so kids, they don't really know much about it, but from like eight to 11 at night, every night, just uncontrolled screaming. Yeah. And I'm trying to read all my cases. You're kind of in this pressure cooker of academic situation. And so there's this scene, which was many a night for me. You know, my wife's been home like nursing and it's just, she's exhausted. I'm home, I'm exhausted. So I put on these airplane conductor giant earphones and I've got, my first son, Cooper, on a baby Bjorn, and I had my HBS cases on an easel on the top of a bookcase. And so I'm reading my cases with these head things on, bouncing my newborn. And I'm like <laughs> reading the cases. And it was just, the, I was like, step out of it. You're like, this is the craziest thing. It's and a scene out of an 80s movie, for sure. We've had, yeah. It, that's Young Mel Gibson plays you know, business dad. Totally. So I, there've been many other crazier things which maybe we can get into over time, but I think that was the, the opening that was not, oh, uh, parenting means from uh, 5 to 7 p.m. I will enjoy some, uh, some food with the littles, perhaps a little reading, and then off to bed. It was not this new workflow. It was a new reality that sort of transcended everything else. And so which I think makes it different than things like fitness or things like new hobbies that you pick up. Yep. If you are a fully engaged dad who, who thinks about kind of a full life way of, of interacting with and pulling your kids into your life. So the 5F framework was shared with me as a basic way to think about some key categories that you'd both assess yourself in. And then given the intensity, uh, the pressure cooker that is having young kids and working and two jobs, et cetera, it's a great framework to, to think about how you can flourish or survive in these, these crazy times. So the five Fs, faith, family, fitness, finance, and friendship are the five Fs. Okay, faith. I read recently that our kids' generation, faith is on the decline in the country, around the world. So a lot of people will say faith, uh, faith doesn't matter. Mm. So why is faith number one? Why, what does faith mean for you? First, at the, the social level of why I would encourage everyone to think through the five Fs is that social researchers say that when you see someone who has a thriving faith life of encountering the transcendent, of thinking about the afterlife, they just report greater levels of flourishing. So like, just adopt the Pascal's wager, even if you don't believe it, like the data says you're gonna flourish, right? <laughs> For me, as a Christian, it, it plays out in different ways. There's sort of this, I got to go to Israel a few months ago, my first trip ever there, and that was this really amazing way to, you know, connect physical places to what I've read and studied for a long time. And I think for Christians, there's a, you know, historical reality of did this particular event of this person who died on a cross, were they resurrected? And what does that mean metaphysically and supernaturally and all sorts of things? So for me, I think it plays out at, at a bunch of levels of like understanding reality, what is reality. And so my faith as a Christian says a lot about how we were made, about uh, created in the image of God. We have a unique dignity. So when I see a drug addict under a bridge, I don't see like, wow, that person's costing society a lot of money. I see like that person is made in the image of God. That is one of God's creatures. Like it, it, really lands for me around a lot of my why. For me, uh, marriage was a big part of that. Um, so there's a real theology of marriage, what's actually happening in a marriage. And then, um, you know, I think having children and raising children, it's it's wonderful, you know, in the image of God as our creator. It's, it's responding to a biblical mandate to, you know, be fruitful and multiply. And uh, there are a lot of, you know, wonderful stories of Abraham and Isaac and generally just uh, God as our father that really connects at a very deep level, especially for a dad with a son, I think. So the faith one is, is probably the deepest. And then what it means to think about that for me really is I'm a pretty right-brained guy and I like being with people sort of thinking lofty things about, you know, Systems. interesting Christian things. And the reality, I think, of being in, you know, the images, being in the body of Christ, being part of the body of Christ, of being in a local 
community of believers, it's rough. Uh, Tim Keller, who I love, talks a lot about this, that, you know, there's some guy that comes to your small group and, um, you know, just for a long time, he just like absolutely hated the guy. But like when you're in a Christian community, you can't uninvite people, right? Anyone can come. <laughs> you're like, oh, you know, Jim or what is it? Jim's coming back. Jim's coming back. And then sure enough, like six months into it, like Jim misses one. They're like, where's Jim? You know? So you like really grow through those kinds of that real kind of authentic community. People become lovely when they are loved. And so there's just hmm. really deep lessons. For some people, practicing faith means like, I'm gonna do rigorous Bible study every morning. And that can be an awesome thing. We think a lot about, you know, communities of practice. Uh, what are the communities of people that we are with? Are we having people in our home? Are we with other families that uh, share some of the same values and are our kids exposed to not just those ideas, but I think, are they exposed to, you know, beautiful people who are working really hard to try to live these things out? Attachment to even even the belief in God, not just in religious practices, on the decline unless your dad engages in a, in a religious practice. Basically, hmm. if uh, according to the studies, if dad goes to church, there is no decline. The kids that are the kids hmm. whose dad are going to church, and what's yeah. weird is it's actually dad and not mom. Yeah, mom's participation in 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 faith and in practice doesn't correlate with like retaining faith between generations the way dad does. Yeah. Have you come across this? Does a little bit. So my, my thesis at Princeton was on faith and fatherhood. And I haven't thought a lot about it since then, but at the time it was pretty interesting. So there's this, I think it's a Gloria Steinem line that says, a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. And a lot of this thinking was in the 70s in the era of no-fault divorce in advocacy around domestic violence as uh, the pill revolution. A lot of those elements were important things for society to wake up and think about those things. But a consequence along the way was basically saying, men are, not only are they not valuable to a marriage and to the rearing of children, they're dangerous. And so that played out through our laws, played out through our social work, et cetera. Yeah. And so this amazing woman, Sarah McClanahan. Yeah, the family courts, for example, my understanding is are just almost structurally, fundamentally yeah. anti-dad. Yeah. There's almost nothing you can do to kind of balance the scales for dad in right. the family court system. And so what's been interesting is, um, to her credit, she was sort of a, you know, politically liberal and shared a lot of the sentiment, what we were just talking about. And they ran this uh, fragile family study where they studied tens of thousands of families over the long term to see how do kids do when dads are involved or not involved. And they let the data answer the question and found that Dads are incredibly important to the rearing of children across basically every social well-being indicator. Pathways are somewhat different for boys and for girls. The skinny amateur version of this is to say one of the important things that it does for boys is it helps them think about authority and power and sort of controlling your, your body and like not being violent. For yeah. girls, one of the things it does is, in the case where the dad is there and, and is in a healthy marriage with the mom, is it set it lays out a set of expectations of what she will look for and demand in her own relationship with a man in the future. So healthy marriage sets the daughter up to say, hey, these are the kinds of markers of what a healthy relationship would look like. So basically what happens is when dad's not around, boys become incredibly violent, engage in early promiscuous behavior, drug use, go to jail, drop out of school. And then what can happen to the girls is that they go out and end up, you know, pregnant really early with a bunch of total duds of men in their life because they weren't given a vision of what that relationship could look like. So it does seem like the tide is turning. I mean, both Bush and Obama talked a lot about fatherhood. Yeah, and oh, so yeah. that's, it's on the men. So I, I hope more people are, are talking about this and just saying, hey, there's been kind of a war on dads and they play really important roles in the rearing of their children. And the old 1950s image of, you know, dad in a suit leaves at 9 a.m. and comes home at 6 p.m. and the wife's made the dinner. Almost no one lives like that anymore. Dads have all kinds of pressures, as women do, but they're different. The next F is family. Mm -hmm. So that's a perfect segue into yeah. you went down a, a rigorous road in education that was incredibly demanding. Mm -hmm. I know I'm sure Harvard Business School is probably like a 60 to 100 hour a week enterprise. Yeah. And then you start starting companies, which is like giving birth to this abstraction of a child yeah. with constant demands 24-7. How do you manage that balance? Mm. Yeah. Like how does the F of family 
play into the entrepreneurial life of Evan Bear? Yeah. So the the family buckets are um, one is about extended family. So being an intentional, uh, both my parents are alive. I have a grandparent alive in-laws, how do you think about vacations and holidays and intentional time and gifts and celebrations? And my wife has lots of great lines, but weddings and funerals, always show up weddings and funerals. First one is sort of the extended family. Next would be marriage. And then a third might be kind of nuclear family, including the, the kids. On the marriage side, there's a great line, another one from Tim Keller, and he says, when your marriage is strong, no matter how adverse the conditions are in the world around you, you will go out into the world in strength. But when your marriage is weak, no matter how amazing the facts and opportunities are around you, you move out into the world in weakness. And if you believe that to be true, it just really is an encouragement to invest in building a very healthy marriage, which even the notion of that feels contrarian, feels weird. I think a common image is we began with this, you know, bodily attraction of this beautiful person, and we're just going to fall in love, and it's just going to be blissful for a long time. And so... You hear this about people when they're engaged or a year or two into marriage and they, they flinch and they're like, wait, I don't really think, I don't know if I love this person. What if I made the wrong decision? Well, the data is pretty wild. The divorce rate among arranged marriages is actually really low. And I mean, there are lots of possible reasons for that. But I think one takeaway is that if you're in the general bounds of compatibility with the other person, repeatedly investing in building that relationship will produce a healthy and fruitful marriage. But it really takes a lot of work. And many people think, oh, work, I shouldn't have to work. It should just be easy. Right. Um, but it is It is a lot of work. Work can mean marriage retreats. I used to think I was really against counseling. I didn't know people. My wife grew up in New York City and, uh, you know, uh, here's my teacher, here's my lawyer, here's my therapist. You know, like everyone does therapy. <laughs> I just didn't have anyone that I knew of. It's a sign of weakness. It's a yeah. sign of problems. Totally. So I didn't know that at all. And then I had a, a mentor who once said, he's like, look, the world's best athletes have coaches. So if you want a great marriage, of course you need a coach. I was like, huh, that makes total sense. Like you just expect to be the world's best golfer. And so that probably 15 years ago opened me up to, we need professionals in our lives to help us be great parents and to be in a great marriage. And so we, we love therapy. We've had some great therapists, some terrible ones. We would, uh, in our early years, I was like, oh God, this is so weird. You wear a mask. You don't want anyone to see you going into this thing. Uh, we actually, <laughs> it's like right early on in business school, we went to this one and it was kind of fun because we would go on, uh, I think a Tuesday night and we'd go at six o'clock and then we'd go out for dinner afterwards. And what was fun is anytime we'd get into a fight during the week, we'd say, wait, save it for Tuesday. And we'd have the fight with the therapist. Like in front of, it was amazing. So really big promoter of, of getting access to resources for mental health. That's been huge for us in, in raising our kids. Our kids have been, they're amazing and they're incredibly difficult and some have more challenges than others, but getting coaches to help you learn some of those approaches along the way is, uh, is super important. So on the marriage side, it's just, how do you invest in that? Someone told me this, they said 10 minutes a day, an hour a week, a day a month, a week and a quarter, a week a year are times that you should have with only your spouse. And so if someone's listening and they don't have kids and they're like, 10 minutes a day, are you serious? Like, <laughs> pretty low with, investment. I'll be with them for hours a day. But it's amazing when you're in the pressure cooker with kids, running around, you fall into bed, you may literally not talk only with your spouse for a few minutes in a day. It's like totally possible that that can happen. So making time, finding ways to invest in that, we did an exercise early creating our family and marriage values, sort of values as a family. Yeah. And we did a little day workshop. We each thought of ones and we kind of mashed them up. They were pretty aligning. And then uh, we framed it and we try to look at it every year as a family and sort of, sort of say like, how are we doing across these things? And so we don't do, it's not a daily check in on those things. I mean, in a good year, we take a few hours once a year to look at it, but just sort of some kind of North star of like, what are we about as a family? You have a family slogan or motto, mm. uh, what is it? So this year it is, we can do hard things for the second year in a row. And that captures this really crazy journey we've been on of going through mold poisoning from this house that we lived in, which has just introduced us to a really wild set of challenges we never anticipated. This was like a hugely crazy thing to hit this busy bear family. We had an eight year old and a five year old about five years ago. And we were a, a two kid family. We had this car we liked, it sat four. We had this house, it like slept four. We had two Saturdays in a row where the eight and five year old woke up 
got cereal for themselves, and we like slept until nine. It's and like, we were oh. like, hi, five, <laughs> yes. we are humans again, we are out of it. The next and, phase um, is finally upon us. Oh my gosh, we were so excited about those mornings, those 5 a.m. mornings are brutal. And I'm on a work trip, it's a Sunday night, late, and I get this text message, like three in the morning, heard my phone vibrate. I would never hear it vibrate, but I heard it, I was like, what's that, look at it. And I call my mom and got sort of the, the news that no one ever wants to get. My brother died in a car crash. She was calling me to say that this happened. And uh, it just, you, you, it sinks, you think you're in a dream or a nightmare, and it's like, oh my gosh. I, go to Florida, he has two teenage kids, and the following week was just horrible on so many levels. And a crazy thing out of that whole story, it's a few weeks later, and my wife doesn't feel right. She's like, I don't, I don't feel like I don't really know what's going on. Hmm. And she comes home a few days later and she says, I'm pregnant. How is this possible? <laughs> not to go into too many details, but it- I mean, I know technically how it did not. It did not seem likely at the time. So she goes into the doctor and sort of, uh, it's very early, but they're like, you're definitely pregnant. So she's on a work trip in California a few weeks later. And she's like, I'm really not well. I need to go to the hospital. So she, she goes to the hospital, like in an emergency situation. And her really good friend lives there and goes with her. And, you know, we're like, did we lose the baby? We don't really know. She's like, we're really on edge. I'm at my house. The, our kids are asleep. So I'm home basically alone with the kids asleep, waiting for this phone call. She's gone to the emergency room. So I get this call from her friend like two hours later. And she's like, I've got, I've got some news. I'm like, what's the news? She says, there's a heartbeat. The baby's okay. And I'm like, this is amazing. I just like sigh of relief. And then she says, well, <laughs> there's some more news. I said, <laughs> what's that? She said, well, there's another heartbeat. And my first thought was, okay, of course my wife's heart is beating. So there's two hearts, you know, and so I like pause and I'm like, why is that news is what I'm thinking anyway. And then, and our friend says, you're having twins. I just sat there and <laughs> it was just like kind of the slow melting, <laughs> melting down, <laughs> excited, not really. And uh, so why not really? We didn't grow up with anyone that really had four kids. It just, just didn't seem like a normal thing. So we were like, what you do is you have two kids. And so <laughs> we, had, we had served our eight years. We were ready to go on family trips together. And right. then- um, Disney World is now something that could be almost enjoyed almost. Yeah, so I think, I think there was a little element of like, I mean, twins been all kinds of things. I mean, the risk of the pregnancy, we'd given rid of all of our baby paraphernalia, you know, and then the fact it was two, we needed a new car, you might need a new house. It's just like all the things associated with this. And we were both really running hard at work, you know, then what, 10, six and double ones and we're like barely alive. So you get hit with this sort of like incredible thing of having these twins. Yeah, so um, we, we, have the, we have the twins, super hard on my wife. She feels really sick all the time, which is sure to do with pregnancy. And then kind of coming out of that was like, she felt not well. She went to all these different doctors, couldn't find out anything. And then finally goes to this functional medicine doctor and they say, you have really high mold count in your body. Hmm. it must be somewhere in your office or your house. And we're like, this is kind of weird. We had this house that seemed like a nice house. We didn't sense any mold. And so we get this inspector out. And after all this crazy uh, research, we find that we have 47 square feet of catomium black mold. Oh, no. Which generates this substance that's regularly used in like chemical warfare. And it was in our air conditioning plenum so like if you were to design a way to kill someone, you would fill your AC with a toxin. And we were in this for, you know, six years. And so we go to these doctors, we all get the labs, so all six of us um, have toxic mold poisoning from living in this house. And we're a few years now into tons of medicines, hyperbaric chambers, uh, extracting all the stuff from your body. There's decent science on how to kind of get it out of your body. Think about it this way. Imagine there was a giant flood and then you got the flood out. The water receded, but what damage did it do while it was in there? And that's the that's the scary part right now. So our twins, the boy twin, was uh, developmentally pretty behind, and he had lots of different therapists. And we ended up sending him this really amazing school that about a third of the kids are like severe neuroatypical, cerebral palsy, Downs, Angelmans, and then they have amazing resources there. And so that journey was really 
it, it's right brained hard because you're trying to solve this problem. How do you get your kid to be on track? And you worry, like, is he going to be able to make it in life? And you think about, well, that was your house that you lived in. Why, why did you let that happen? You know, you ask God, why did you let that happen? There's a lot in that. I think a, a hard one, a thread that was powerful for me was, was wrestling with the idea that the son that you have may not be anything like or anywhere near the vision of the son that you imagined having. Hmm. And I think that really comes forward in the area of, of disability. And so we had this issue with our older son who had lots of weird things going on. And my wife was amazing on this quest to say, we got to find the best doctor. We got to get to the, what is going on here? And I think I was, I was some mix of like slow and, and stubborn and like not that helpful on it. I think the underlying issue then and, and now is like, what if your son like can't play sports? Or like, what if your son, you know, uh, has a set of conditions that like makes it really hard for him to get a job? And it's been hard, but a really beautiful thing to be in this community at this, this special needs school where a number of the kids will be forever nonverbal. Our daughter, Elle, said something about Scott. Scott was trying to say something and she was like, she said to him, well, maybe you should get your talker. And so some of these kids that are forever nonverbal have the iPads yeah. that they wear and it's called their talker. And uh, so to see little kids develop that empathy and connection with each other of, of some kids that have really tough situations is it's really beautiful and context setting for me about kind of the stuff that we're working on. But I think there is a nerve, there, there's a strain there, not just, oh, my kid likes guitar and not saxophone, but like we probably have unstated visions for our kids about who they are and what they do, maybe what they look like, how good they are at what things. And maybe we're not even conscious of those. And then when you start to see that like this little person is not becoming the person that you anticipated, it's really hard. There aren't a lot of like cultural expectations or resources for us to grapple with these hangups we have about our own kids, about our sons, about our daughters, about the extent to which we have to grapple with like, do we want what's best for them or do we want something for them that's good for us? Mm. Even if it's just a vision of like, I'm a successful dad. Yeah. My kid is going to be, my kid is smart. Right. My kid is great. My kid's going to get into Harvard or Harvard and Yale or Harvard and Yale and Princeton. <laughs> that, it's really a hard thing. There's no roadmap mm. Mm. for navigating this. And one of the things I think is interesting is, you know, you sort of alluded to this. That, that, like, I, I feel like you think about being a man and being a father in a, in a, in a way that is not what I think that what people maybe have, like a cartoon character version mm. of being a man and being a dad. Mm. Like, oh, you're you're tough and you're stern and what we're talking about now is being in touch with your emotions mm -hmm. and your own being mm -hmm. in a really kind of deep, rich way, like deep emotional work mm -hmm. that you have to do, right? How do you think about what it means to be a man and a father in that kind of context of these things that we're not, we're not given any tools for this, mm -hmm. you know, and our, and our dads kind of don't, necessarily give us the tools for it either in some respects you know each generation is grappling with emotions in different ways yeah well just like i used to think getting therapy was a sign of of weakness I actually later reframe and say no it's actually a sign of strength it's a sign of getting stronger i think the same thing applies to vulnerability it's Brene brown's line she says why is it that when we see vulnerability practiced in someone else we encounter it as strength and you tell me something really sad or personal about yourself. I'm like, wow, that's so strong that John said that. And then she continues and says, but when we practice vulnerability ourselves, we experience it as weakness. Hmm. So when I'm on the cusp of saying something about myself that's vulnerable, I feel like I'm about to be really weak. Even though when we see it in others, we know that it's really strong. So if you can kind of square that circle and actually recognize that just like Leaning into getting help actually makes you stronger. Leaning into vulnerability and things that are not going well, um, not only is it a sign of strength, it actually communicates great strength to the world. It's also some of the work that actually literally does make you a stronger person. But I really had to reframe that because it really was for me like, oh, talk about 
you know, the really hard time that someone died or the really hard time that you were depressed or whatever. It's like, oh, suck it up. Don't be down. Let's focus on, you know, bullet points and uh, Tim Ferriss or, you know, something like that. <laughs> I only have one. And when he was born, it was this head rewiring thing mm. that I wasn't expecting. I, yeah, I was working in New York City. It was super competitive and I'm ambitious. So I wanted to be Steven Spielberg. So that I'm constantly judging mm. myself about how far along I'm getting and I'm not getting far enough, fast enough. Yeah. And then his birth completely rewired my brain hmm. in ways I didn't anticipate. Was, was there a really big brain rewire that happened hmm. as you became a dad, either with your first child or with the twins or in between where it was like you kind of look back and say, I changed like who I am, how hmm. I think hmm. because of becoming a dad. The image that comes to mind is like waves sort of like washing over me and sort of like slowly refining over these like different experiences. And, and a big one really was the experience of my brother's death, thinking about his legacy. That funeral was, there were, there were like thousands of people there and he had coached something like 70 seasons of kids sports. And uh, it's really funny. We are like so different as people. <laughs> um, I remember one time I was like, hey, uh, do you wanna go get coffee? Uh, it's like at his house. Hey, do you want to get coffee? He's like, there's coffee in the fridge. <laughs> like, like it was not even something that one would do to like go get coffee at like a place that serves coffee. <laughs> so you know, he just coaches every sport. He plays every sport. There was this like, there was this whole set of like African-American women that came that we learned he was in a bowling league with them. It was like just the craziest stories. Gosh, thinking about, you know, the legacy that he left, all those parents and the kids who, you know, for a season of their t-ball or volleyball team or whatever, you know, just felt so cared for by him and loved on by them. You know, it was, it was, um, it was I know, super powerful for my wife, of, for her thinking about what really matters and what do you want your legacy to be? And uh, the Brooksian sort of, you know, resume versus eulogy virtues contrast, his eulogy virtues, he had no resume virtues. He like just totally didn't care. And so built all these things, the kind of things that, you know, create a legacy. And so I think for me, it's been, if, if the early days were like, I will read these cases, this will not slow me down. I will compartmentalize and manage this to be kind of in a pocket over here so I can still do all my stuff. It's been a story of kind of waves washing over you, both around the right way to think about it. It's like, these are, these are people that you've created. Then also what that looks like on a practical basis. A really fun one for me, I think a lot of us grew up, our, our, our dad's generation was, they would leave for work and they'd come home at the end of the day and maybe you knew what they did, maybe you didn't really. And so I think it's really fun now to pull kids into work and, and give them little jobs, maybe pay them, teach them skills. So during the COVID craziness, we had a little pod school set up. So I was working really right next to my son a lot. And so he started a podcast because we were doing a lot of media stuff. And just that he could, see what we're doing and how we're learning. And he was like, uh, hey, dad, like, what? He's like, uh, we got the mayor on the show. I was like, the mayor of what? He's like, the mayor of Austin. And he just like emailed him <laughs> on the website and like booked him and scheduled the thing. And so that's been really fun, I think, to, to pull kids into stuff. For me, every year they get older, it's a lot more fun. Uh, with our first one, my wife was like, Later, she was like, I sort of worried that you didn't like children. <laughs> I mean, think about a kid under one years old. They're they like plants. They destroy, they're worse than plants. They're absolutely worse well, than plants. They move from plant stage to like beast stage yeah. before they start to become like but a But just person. think about it. It like, it destroys your sleep. It like kind of destroys your wife physically. It is like a mess in your house. It's expensive. I mean, it's bad. So I'm mostly kidding. Some dads really like it and that's cool. I just, I was not a baby person. It works out well. My wife does not really like two-year-olds. I love two-year-olds. So there's this kind of complementarity, but each year that they go by, uh, the conversations become, the battles become more oral and less physical. So it's the battle of the mind and you get to pull them into stuff and have disagreements and see their own you know, convictions about the world my son, he said, they were given this writing prompt at school, which uh, is a topic for another time, but the topic was, do you experience climate anxiety? Which I don't like as a question. <laughs> and, it's, a que uh, it's a question that induces climate anxiety by totally, design. Totally, totally. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the version, right. the direction of his answer was something like, no, the answer is nuclear, facts don't care about your feelings. <laughs> 
I was just and like a personal sketch of Ben Shapiro's face I was like, on, this, on the answer. This is a great day. So so anyway, <laughs> as those, those years go by, it's more fun and uh, and really fun to pull them into work. And uh, and so I had I had this little thing where we had a number of like college babysitters over time, and, and then someone to kind of intern. And I was pretty shocked that like college seniors were not familiar with the basic tools of the workforce or modern workforce. Uh, Dropbox, Asana, task management, Airtable, our shared love, passion for a tool. And I was like, I just really want my kids to know how to navigate the world they're entering into. And so they're in some interesting schools that, you know, as a part of a final project, it's you will create a video blog. Like it's not just like write an essay, but like actually get them some real skills and, and push stuff onto them. So as the years have gone by, it's uh, it's become a lot more fun. You've navigated a, a world, a Silicon Valley world, and somewhat justified caricature of Silicon Valley is that it's a world of mostly men, mostly sort of ab abrupt systems thinkers mm. who can sometimes be maybe bro-y. Mm. Uh, doesn't seem like an environment for vulnerability, mm. but is that a caricature? What's been your experience of navigating a work world as an entrepreneur who's in touch with being vulnerable and, and, and faith and family? On the surface, a lot of the stuff happening in Silicon Valley right now feels like and looks like on the surface, it's about engaging the whole person. It's about engaging being vulnerable. It's, oh, you really are against Israel. Let's have a rally around that. Oh, you are excited about trans youth. Let's have a rally around that. It feels like it's welcoming the whole person, but I think it's, it's, it's completely not that. It's actually something totally unrelated. And actually creating a space such that people come into the workforce and sort of talk through what's not going well, I think is really rare and really hard to pull off. I'm also not certain that there are a lot of personal you know, mental health and family and addiction and all sorts of things that like probably for most workplaces, it's nearly not going to be part of the culture that you build. And I think that's where, you know, the stats and insights around the erosion of uh, faith communities, which you mentioned earlier, and just the loneliness pandemic generally, most men in America have say that they don't have a single person in whom they confide. So it's definitely not happened in the workplace. Right. So at home, you know, this is what, when Tocqueville was uh, laying the foundation and bragging about what was to become the Lions or the Elks or the Rotary or the VFW, those were not places that had amazing counseling resources. You know, you go down to a VFW and it's like <laughs> some 80 year olds talking about the war, you know, but something really important does happen when those two guys are at the bar. It is a chance that something can come up in passing. It can be a, it can be a remark. It can be a guy that doesn't show up for a few weeks and actually has cancer and no one else knows. That social capital, that civil society, those, as Burke would call it, the little platoons, was something so unique about America. And I think explains a lot of the successes we have as a society and a handful of factors really come in to um, go for the jugular of that space and really undermine it. This is another area where we don't have a lot of places to turn to start. Mm. It's like, oh, well, maybe I can't necessarily be super vulnerable or deal with some of these richer life problems mm. in my workplace. And maybe mm. that's not appropriate. But then, you know, if most men in America don't have one person to confide into, is there a place to start? Is mm. there a, mm. even if it's uncomfortable or even if it's like a bad answer? Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's so good. I love this. Well, part of this is about, Part of it's about being a father, but I even widen the aperture more to just being a man and being capable and healthy and developing as a person as you go out into the world. So at the larger level, it's probably true that uh, someone's line, I'll forget who said it, but it's, what if you assumed everyone you met was in a battle that you couldn't see? And most people, probably everyone has some version of that in their own life. And whether that is, I heard a stat last week, 42% of boys in sort of this most recent generation encountered some version of sexual abuse as a kid. Like Man. nearly every other kid that you see at a playground. So there'd be things from your past. There can be current realities about illness or abuse or addiction. I mean, the stats on all that stuff is, is pretty wild. And so I think having a, a posture of compassion towards yourself I would say, man, I've been running really hard. Like, what are some things that I could use some outside resources on? That'd be like the first step to just be curious about 
how you're encountering the world. And then, you know, there's easy anonymous ways. There's Headspace, there's apps, right, that you can use. You can read stuff if you don't want to talk to a real person, but there's really great apps that make accessing like professional coaches, therapists, counselors, uh, really easy. And you can do it from the privacy of your own home. Uh, finding therapy resources in person. Often churches may have these networks or other religious organizations. So I think self-care is, is a big piece of that. I think for men, you know, we probably have other men in our lives that we call our friends. And I have been really lucky to have some friends that were really intentional with me about this, but maybe a charged people would be, you know, what would it look like to take a step to become like more vulnerable and a better friend to Joe or this person that I can think about? And so maybe that's just like, if you were planning to go out for drinks anyway, or go play around to golf or something, um, what might be some, you know, slightly edgy questions that you could hold out there to create some more conversation? Maybe you're asking them some questions. Maybe you like, you know, hey, did I ever tell you about that like really dark time in my life? You know, maybe it's a bad opener of a question, but <laughs> just kind of broaching some of that vulnerability with someone that you're already kind of, you know, friends with and have that with could be could be a space, but it is really hard where to start, how to find these resources, and then to double click on the version of that, some of those issues, but just as about being a dad, there's this great podcast called Dad Saves America. <laughs> um, but really there are not, there's, there's a few books out there that are, that are worth it. Um, I do think there's a version of like a community of practice though of some other dads that you're probably already friends with that you kind of commit together. Maybe once a month, those dads get together and think like, how can, you know, let's trade some ideas on what are some really cool things we could do with our kids to be more intentional. I think one takeaway that I have is, and I, I'm, I tend to, I'm Italian, so I get like, uh, being vulnerable with people is actually almost too easy in some respects. <laughs> I'm, I'm a total blubbery guy. Uh, but at another level, I do think it is, it's like there's like a, there's like a threshold with so many male relationships that it's probably the case that both sides of the relationship would, would like to just be able to talk more openly about mm. things that are difficult and and both somebody has to be the first mover and that right. is what i'm hearing you say and yeah. like why not have that be you yeah why not be the one to go out on the limb a little bit mm -hmm. I, I do think that that's you know there's this there's this like culture of like manly man stuff mm. which what's more courageous than like opening your heart to somebody else right i mean you know how do you think about courage hmm I mean, traditional notion there of courage would be, you know, heroic acts that we think of as physical, of saving someone from a burning building or defeating a terrorist or something. And it's, a, it's still courage, it's a different form. And I think in some ways it feels uh, easier to go shoot a bad guy than to unpack a story that you've, you've never told before. And uh, I think what, what's exciting in general as some of these things become more mainstreamed and more tools are accessible to us is the freedom that people encounter through some version of that connection or that recovery unleashes them to just live dramatically different lives. It's kind of this cliche, uh, but it becomes so true. It's sort of the notion of uh, of guilt is that you did something wrong. But the notion of shame is that you are something wrong. Oh, that's really interesting. I've never, I've never heard that phrase before. Yeah, so guilt. Say, say that again. I, I want to so make sure I, understand, that I hear that right. The idea is that to be guilty, to feel guilty, is that you did something wrong. I uh, stole a magazine from the store. And shame is that you are something wrong. Play this out in the case of, uh, of abuse, for example. So someone's saying, you know, I was a young girl and I was abused as a young girl. And so the shame is that I am this broken person. I mean, in that particular case, something terrible happened to you, but you have this shame. And, and the thinking that goes around that is, you know, if you actually knew who I was, if I ex brought into the light that dark corner, I would encounter rejection. It would be so beyond what you could imagine uh, you couldn't be friends with anymore, with me anymore. That's what people think. And so that's why we become so guarded about these things. It feels so dangerous to imagine those things being in the light. And usually what happens is when those things come into the light, there's pretty wild, like, compassion. Oh my gosh, like, you were so innocent in that. I hate that that happened to you. 
in some cases, some versions of like, hey, many of us also had the same thing or were in a similar situation. And so there's just like really wild healing that's possible from that. And we will go through something like that. I mean, they're just, they can just be unleashed and free from kind of being uh, imprisoned by what we've been trying to keep secret. We've touched on three of the five, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in a very real sense, faith, family, and friendship. Mm -hmm. Fitness is pretty straightforward, right? Pretty straightforward. I think maybe a cliche is like uh, starting on that earlier in life and to begin with a vision of being a healthy grandfather that can you know, actively run and jump and play with grandkids and just building those patterns in, in your 20s and your 30s sets people up for success on that. And what if you failed at doing that in your 20s and 30s and you're sitting here at, I don't know, say 44? <laughs> well, I have, I have this functional medicine doctor and I love how he thinks about this. He says, um, so men die of uh, primarily one of four things, heart attack, heart disease, cancer, or complications from Alzheimer's dementia. And his job as your doctor is to help you figure out which is your ticket and then prepare your body to fend off that disease as long as possible. Hmm. And so once you're treating disease, it's, it's some version of palliative care, essentially. And so uh, preventing disease is the place to play. And so we do all these genetic tests. So I'm an APOE 4-4, which means that sort of if unplanned for, if untreated, I have like an 80% likelihood of getting Alzheimer's dementia. Hmm. So wow. at, at some point in your life. So that feels like bad news. It's like 1% of the population. It's actually kind of pleasant for you, but it's like devastating for your family, right? It's like really bad. So if you can know that, then there's certain ways that you'd prepare your body. Just like if you're going to go cross country skiing versus hiking, you know, you'd prepare physically differently. If you know what's going to take you out and you kind of prepare your body in that way. So I, I like that kind of approach. And I think I used to think of functional medicine is like, you know, that hippie aunt you have that, uh, you know, does wheatgrass juice emulsion or something. And uh, actually, I'm like pretty shocked at how bad our healthcare system is where essentially all answers are pharmacological. The answers are, here's a script, go, you know, try this medicine that's going to make you more happy or less happy or less anxious or whatever. There's major things you can do in uh, diet, lifestyle, over-the-counter stuff in the broad space that I think we'd call, you know, functional medicine. Finance. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, this is an area I want to cover a lot on Dad Saves America because I feel like as people that go through any form of a traditional education system, if you don't go to economics or, or business school in particular, you get almost none of it. You come out and I went to film school. I didn't get any of it. So you come yeah. out and <laughs> it's like you don't know anything about like, yeah, why do mortgages have interest rates and what's that all like? Yeah. So how do you think about the that well, fifth well, S of hey, finance? Look, all those different schools I went to, I didn't learn anything about personal finance. And so See, that's even crazier. So you went to Harvard Business School and you come out like, oh, I don't know how to balance my checkbook. Yeah. And, and I mean, the great irony is most like, for example, think about tax. So the, the common you know, job pathway out of our business school is like maybe you become a partner at a consulting firm and you make two and a half million dollars a year. Pretty much most of those people just like pay 60% in taxes. And they're just like, this is my share and I'll just take it. Meanwhile, like there are, you know, some guy in Milwaukee owns 11 storage centers and pays like almost no tax and just bought his second house, right? There's this, there's this scrappiness to, I think a lot of the, is it Kawasaki, the Millionaire Next Door series that it's weird in, in elite circles, it's like looked down upon to be like scrappy about tax or to like figure out something. There's something weird going on there. And so I'm a, uh, I think the line that sticks with me about finances is um, if you don't master your money, it will master you. And it's uh, in the school of thought, you might think of something like, uh, what is your number for like crazy type A people who want to build and, and want to make money? If you can set a number and that number could be your total net worth, it could be the amount you want to live on per year, but it's sort of your like, you know, in conversation with your spouse, it's kind of your finish line. Because I think what most people do, if they work really hard, they may hit that really early, but then it's just like, you know, you're you're the richest family in a neighborhood and you have a nice house and, and you sell a company or something and then you move to the nicer neighborhood and now you're like the medium house and you're like really sad. Like most people who make a lot of money become 
set. I mean, I think you've said, you've seen this stuff, diminishing marginal yeah. returns yep. but o- over some threshold, 60 grand a year or something, um, yeah. you're no happier. And I think part of that is there's not much of a plan. Now, the people that think really creatively about this, there's a great story in this community called Generous Giving of this husband and wife who they were inheriting a small business on his side of the family. He was a crane company. And uh, they said, well, this business could become a big thing. We don't really know. And they said, well, you know what? We're just going to go and say, set up in our legal structures. We're going to pay ourselves $120,000 a year. We cannot make any more. That's the amount of money we need to live comfortably. And that company has explosive growth and becomes worth a billion dollars. And they kept their promise. They did not pay themselves a dollar more than that. And they had the most amazing time giving away all that money. They gave away a billion dollars. Financial planning and being really smart about your money allows you to really deliver on your values. It doesn't mean buying a boat, although it could if you want a boat. I love boats. But it could mean like doing really cool things about maybe it is a second house because you really love hosting your extended family or letting friends who don't have one have a free place to go have a vacation. Or I love seeing people being on these journeys of generosity early in their life to think about God, I'm so excited to just go make as much money as I can because, man, we could be so generous. We could do so many cool things with this money. So that kind of investment, I think, means getting counsel, reading books, talking a lot with your spouse. A lot of husband wife teams have different levels of financial savvy. So getting on the same page about that plan and having the right set of professionals around you to uh, you know keep you accountable and put it in place. I think I read that um, an enormous number of marital challenges ultimately have roots in in financial distress at the family yeah. level. I don't yeah. know what the I don't remember what the number was. It might be over 50%. Yeah. Are there things you do with your with your wife to stay on the same page about mm. about family finances and do that kind of planning? Is there like a practice that you engage yeah. in? Well, it, the broader practice we really enjoy is laid out in this book called Fair Play. And it's this really interesting woman who did uh family and tax planning for these like wealthy families. And she was like, I can help these big complicated families live at peace, but like my own marriage is terrible. What's going on? So she wrote this book called Fair Play. Eve Rodsky is her name. And it's this really great book. And it's literally the concept is there's a hundred cards and then you can create some of your own. And a card could be uh, weekday dinners, weekend dinners, dentist, finances. Each card is kind of area of responsibility for the family. One of my favorite cards is called Magical Beings. So that's like the bunny, <laughs> Easter bunny and the tooth fairy or whatever. The concept is not that you should have 50-50 on the cards, but it's uh, you can actually play play with the deck and you, you lay them out. And the idea is to get some clarity on what the roles are and mutually establish what they'd call the standard of care is for that area. So, okay, honey, you're going to do the dentist card. The standard of care just means get them to any dentist once a year. Okay, that's the standard of care. So I would love practicing that ourselves. We love giving people the book. And uh, many friends have just made huge progress. Even if the guy works all the time and ends up with just 10 of the cards, the fact that she has clarity and he knows what he needs to get done with his 10. So that's our broader frame uh, for thinking about it. That's been hard for us. You know, I think we had this vision. My wife would love to have very detailed reporting to know exactly how we spend all of our money. And there's some really cool things about that. Creating a system that delivers on that accurately, like for your personal finances, is really hard and really annoying to do that. So we're kind of in a round right now, like rebooting some of those people in our life that can be financial planners and tax, et cetera. And then there's some, uh, there's one particular new person in my life who's kind of like that scrappy Jewish uncle that I never had, who's got all these crazy ideas about like how to structure things tax wise and what goes into trust and do this. And it's like, there's this whole world about being smart with personal finances that I feel like is this like hidden knowledge. And uh, you got to find a guy, you got to find a guy. <laughs> you got to get, you got to get, have, you got to have the consigliere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> As we wrap up, what are your top three pieces of advice for busy dads to manage their priorities in life? Mm. You know, you've got a lot of priorities. You've got four kids. You've got a professional entrepreneurial spouse. You, you have started multiple businesses. We haven't talked about this, but you're now a venture capitalist. So you're raising money, you're traveling, you're hosting events. So you like, you know, you're one of these people I know in my life that always, when I really think about, makes me feel lazy. 
<laughs> Even though I work like 60 hours a week. Yeah, top three pieces of advice for, mm. for, for the busy family, for the busy family man mm. to prioritize. I'm going to do it in, as three books that are a piece of advice with each of the books. I Know How She Does It is a book written mostly for women, but it works for men too. And the idea is that there's 168 hours in a week, which is an incredible amount of time to be diligent with how you spend the time. Two quick ones for how that played out for us. We were grinding really hard at work. We were always getting home late for dinner. That hour from 5.30 to 6.30 is terrible for kids. Everyone's unhappy. So we said, let's do work late Wednesdays. Let's work until midnight on Wednesday, but every other night, let's get home at five. Hmm. So you just kind of like little rearranging your schedule. It can really help you extract more out of how you think about your week. So that book gives some very practical planning approaches to 168 hours is a lot of hours. And how do you make the most of every minute of it? Uh, second is fair play. The piece of advice out of fair play is being very intentional about your division of labor with your spouse and other key parties in your family. So advice in this that my wife loves to give is hire people to do the things that you don't want to do. Don't hire a babysitter to be with your kids Saturday afternoon while you go to Target. Be really clear. I want to be with my kids. And so when possible, hire people and put resources together that let you get more of that time. So feel sort of brutal or weird to say that, but it's like, think about building your, your family operating system, including some outside resources, grandparents, et cetera, that let you really have the time that you want both with your kids, but then also with your spouse. And one of my favorite books, and this will be my third piece of advice, is a book called How to Talk So Kids Will Listen and Listen <laughs> So Kids Will Talk. And my aunt gave me this book 30 years ago, and I never read it until about five years ago when someone else told me to read it. And it's an approach to how to communicate and to connect with your kids. And every bone in my body wants to fight it and do the opposite. This book has lots of cartoons. And so little Jimmy comes up and says, uh, Sally stole my pencil. And the dad and the thing says, uh, no, she didn't. You say, no, she's really stole my pencil. Oh, I bet you just left it in the car. And basically it's like, answer after answer, it is just dismissing the needs of the kid. And the dad probably is right in that case. But the reframe out of this book is employing this lavish empathy and curiosity with your kid, which feels like being soft on them, but it has amazing effects. Jimmy comes up, Sally stole my pencil. Ah, it must feel terrible that Sally stole your pencil. <laughs> yeah, I think she maybe put it in the kitchen. Oh man, you love that pencil. You used to draw sketches with it. Now you don't even have that pencil. <laughs> yeah, maybe she left it in the kitchen on the counter. Gosh, well, if you ever found it again, you could keep sketching those dinosaurs you did last week. Well, maybe I'll go see if I find it in the kitchen. Jimmy walks, finds in the kitchen. Dad, I found my pencil. Right, so the whole frame is this opportunity to seed the tapes. Your kid probably, our kids probably will be in therapy one day <laughs> and they're gonna have some lines that stuck with them that they tell their therapists and that's replaying the tapes. And so as dads today, we get the opportunity to, to record the tape. So what are those lines? Like when I came to my dad to complain about something or whatever, is it like, am I being dismissed? Am I being criticized? Am I being laid the rules out? Or was like, man, he was there, he got it. And we saw these problems together. And in a little one that feels so obvious to so many people, it is shocking the number of people who as adults will actually say like, my dad or maybe my mom, my dad never told me he loves me. And it's just so, it's so sad to think about how easy it is to say those words on a regular basis to your kids, to just record the tapes so that like at their darkest moments in whatever crazy crises they will absolutely encounter later in life, in that moment they're like, you know, Dad's got me. He loves me. There's one person in this world, maybe two with your mom, um, that deeply, you know, care about me and are curious about me. Send us out on this line, which I recently picked up, which I love. Everyone in this world is born looking for someone looking for them. So as dads, knowing that these little people come into the world and they're just wide-eyed and they're looking up. And what they're wanting is like us to just 
look right at them and say, I see you. And you don't have to do it 20 hours a week. You can do a few moments a week. How that shapes your kids and gives them a sense of connection, purpose, and dignity is, um, is a game changer. Wow, those three books, the three pieces of advice, that's, that's a lot for, for us to, to head out with. So before we wrap things out, I, I want to ask you a question I ask all our guests, which is, how do you think of your, your role? You love the hero's journey. Hmm. What's your heroic dad's role in the American story? It's a big question. It's a big question. The word that lands on me when I think about my role it's not the wild-eyed founder like Elon who's got some world-changing particular thing. It's also not the tactician who has a unique bond trading strategy. It's really about organizing people that when they share values can go do dramatic things for this country that really has to do about creating opportunity for people. That there lingers, it's, uh, it's not been extinguished, but it, there's some windy days on this flame, the flame of opportunity that people around the world in nearly every country would sell their leg, sell their owls, sell their kid, do crazy things to get to live in this country yeah. because it reflects opportunity. That they could do something here that they could not do anywhere else. So that's the end that I'm working on is that opportunity in this country and how I get there. I don't think I'm the idea guy. I think I'm not the tactician. I think it's like, um, we're gonna bring a merry band of warriors that together we can, we can do some big things. I can't think of a better place to end oh. our conversation. Evan, thank you for being on Dad Saves America you've given our audience and me so many resources in this conversation mm. to think about. Uh, I'm happy to have you as a friend and, uh, and I think the world is better for what you're doing. Mm. Great to be with you. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Evan Baer. Be sure to check out his book, Get Backed. We'll post a link down below. I think my biggest takeaway is the importance of fostering a mindset capable of overcoming the inevitable challenges life throws our way. As dads, we must embrace change and be prepared to do hard things so our families and the country can flourish. But I wanna hear from you. Share your thoughts below and I look forward to engaging with you in the comments. If you got value from this conversation, please share it with your friends and family. And be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. At Dad Saves America, we believe that dads are heroes that play an essential role in overcoming the challenges we all face together. And now I leave you with a dad doing something awesome. All right, then, let's go. <laughs> Over and up. Ready? What? What? Over and down. Good job. Hey. <laughs> hey, thank you for behaving. Yes, you are behaving already. Over and or third gear. <laughs> Do you like shifting gears? Yeah. Right, ready? And, and I like behaving too. And fourth gear. I love you, kiddo. I love you too. <laughs>